so in IUCGO, Aditi had a great idea recently, which was to split the SDK app module and the IBC module. So this will make looking through the code very easy. Um, so we're, I'm only going to be looking at the IBC module because the app module is just a way of registering SDK modules. So we have this IBC module. And in this entire file, we will be implementing the IBC interface I talked about. Um, so the first functions we'll look at are these channel uh, handshake callbacks. And the main purpose of the channel handshake within ICS20 is just setup. We want to make sure that our ICS20 transfer, our ICS20 channels are unordered. Doesn't they don't need to be ordered? And ordered channels can cause um, closure if a timeout occurs. So we want to do things like check that the uh, that the channel is ordered. We want to make sure that the port that is being used on our chain matches the ICS20 port. We want to make sure the version matches. And so a lot of these channel handshakes steps, we'll just call this validate transfer channel params. And here we just have a list of some basic checks. So as I talked about, we have the ordering check, we have the port binding check, we have the version check. And then in ICS20, in our implementation, we have this very interesting check here, which is we get the channel sequence and we check that the channel sequence is not greater than a UN32. And the reason for this is not because the ICS20 specification says it needs to not be greater than a UN32. The reason is because in our implementation, based on uh, the SK implementation at the time, it did not support multiple module accounts. So when we, wanted, when we wanted to escrow, we had to create new accounts, but these new accounts might actually collide with regular user accounts, or they might collide with other um, escrow accounts that we're creating based on these channel ID, ID sequences. And so there was a lot of discussion and a lot of verification. And the solution we came up with, which let's see if I can find the function, here it is. So we have this get escrow address function and it takes the port and channel that this token is being sent across. So the source port and channel, and it creates a hash of it. Um, and then it uses this hash as the address. And so because the channel ID sequences are always changing, we needed to actually ensure that there was no collision here. So Andre was right, nice enough to actually do this check in a brute force manner for all of the channel sequences up to a UN32. Um, since it seemed riskier, that it seemed more likely there might be a collision if we went up to UN64. I'm not sure if there is or not, but for security reasons in our implementation, we just enforce that the channel sequence cannot be greater than a UN32. The SDK has implemented sub accounts now for module accounts to avoid this concern of escrow address collision. So in the future, we might migrate to that and then we would be able to remove this check. But I don't think we're going to be uh, running into uh, having to worry about running out of channel I, uh, transfer channels anytime soon. But if you see that, that is the context of why this check is there. Any questions on that? Because that's like a bit of information. Cool. And, and, and the sequence, the sequence keep, keeps increasing, right? Uh, the more IBC transfers that they make, is is the sequence eventually um, this tie to the, 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 the functionality, for example, port will have its own sequence, but it, in the future, another IBC app will have a different sequence, or is this like a sequence for any IBC transfer, let's say? So the channel sequences are global. So these are channel sequences on our chain. So if we have multiple IBC applications, they're all sharing from the same namespace. So it's possible that opening channels for other applications could diminish the available channels that could be opened for ICS 20. Um, but again, two to 32 is pretty large, but these sequences are linear. So it starts from zero and it increments by one for each new channel opened. So you would need to open two to 32 channels before we'd run out. And the assumption there I think was like, 
if you did the math of like the like amount of messages needed to process to do that, it's like many, many years and like a lot of money because you got to like pay the gas for it. So it's like the, the DOS attack is just like not effective. You would like see this coming from like years away and you'd have years to like deal with it and bump it to two to 64. Okay. And there's no risk of um, two channels claiming the same channel sequence number, right? Because no, ch channels don't claim the, um, yeah. like no one, you don't, when you open a channel, you're not specifying the sequence. Core IBC is assigning you a sequence number. Yeah. Uh, and, and and there's no risk because uh, um, the messages, even if you want to uh, open two channels at the same time, the, the, the messages are anyway handled sequentially, right? So Correct. one after the other and there's no, okay, yeah. Correct. Cool. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of breeze through these channel handshake functions. So uh, basic validation on chain open in it. More basic validation on chan open try. Um, there's this interesting, um, there's two interesting things here on the open init and open try. In open init, we claim the channel capability. So when we open a channel and we go through core IBC, core IBC creates this capability for this channel and it expects some sort of application to claim a capability for this channel as well. So in open init, we go ahead and we claim that capability because we know that it hasn't been claimed yet because Core IBC had just created it and it had just called our application. On chan open try, we, what you should have gone through in the channel handshake is that it's possible to have a crossing hellos. And in this case, if there's a crossing hellos, we might have actually claimed the capability in chan open in it. So we have this first if statement here to ensure that we haven't actually already claimed this capability. If we haven't claimed the capability, then we go ahead and claim it. Um, so that is that piece of code. Any questions on capabilities? Because I went over that really fast. Cool. Um, then very little checks on chain open act and chain open confirm. And then here, as I said, um, chain close in it goes ahead, oops, and close and it goes ahead and returns an error so that if a user tries to send a message of closing this channel, it will not process because the application callback will fail. What could succeed is this chan close confirm, but this means the other side would have set their uh, channel to be closed. Again, the only situation I could think of is an unlike client attack. So it's possible we may want to actually change this to return an error as well. Um, and in that case, then this couldn't be closed without someone, without the validators just arbitrarily changing the state to closed. Cool. So now we get into the uh, the important I have a section. Quick, quick question, just about that. Um, yep. A callback. If if that were updated to like return an error instead of nil, would that require a coordinated upgrade? A yes, it would, because okay. the uh, nodes that didn't upgrade would not return an error on that message, and nodes that did upgrade would return an error, and that causes an Apache mismatch. Yeah, right. Cool. Makes sense. Um, but again, the like this attack would require a uh, a like client attack, and when IBC was initially activated, it was activated under the assumption that such an attack was just not possible at the current at the current state of things. And if you can pull off a like line attack, you're able to actually steal those funds instead of just, you know, close the channel. Right. So it would be more valuable to steal everybody's funds than to close yes, the channel. <laughs> exactly. Because you could you could basically on that with using the like line attack, you could just generate this packet in state that was never actually sent. And then the counterparty would think that you sent this packet. Mm -hmm. And then you could just drain all of the tokens that have been escrowed into your receiving address. Cool. So nice. not a, a, the, <laughs> the bigger concern is definitely just the light client attack in general, not exactly what they could do. Cool, thanks. Cool, so now we're looking at the receiving. Actually, before we go into the receiving side, 
So this is the IBC module interface. One thing you'll notice is that what was not included in this interface is the sending. Um, so we're going to jump into that now. The idea is that the application is always triggering the send of a packet. So the application is going to Core IBC and it's saying, here is my IBC packet. I want to send this. And Core IBC will go ahead and do a little bit of validation. And you should have looked at that in the channel walkthrough. And so if we go to that very quickly, we see this send packet function and it's taking in a channel capability. This is the same channel capability that should have been claimed by the application and it's taking in a packet. And so this is the application coming with the channel capability in the packet and core IBC do a couple, you know, basic validation, just ensuring that the channel is like okay to be used. It checks this capability, ensuring that this capability is the, the same capability that's associated with this source port and channel. That's fine. Then it will also uh, do some more logic on the, the packet, such as ensuring that the packet destination port matches the actual counterparty of this channel and same with the channel ID. So it's the application coming to Core IBC saying, hey, send this packet. And then Core IBC is like, is this packet like okay to be sent? Is all the information correct? If so, then it's pro then it writes the packet commitment. Cool. But on the application side, let's go ahead and look at where we are actually sending this packet. And that would be in, I believe, relay.go. Um, so quickly, actually, if I zoom out, in IABC Go, we have this message server. So the message server takes in a message transfer over here. And then it will go, this comes from the base application in the SDK. So the relayer submits this message transfer. That gets routed to this function. This function just go ahead and sets up things. And then it calls the ICS20 keeper function send transfer. And this is where the bulk of the information is. Um, there's some more analogies I wrote a long time ago explaining uh, transfer sending. So you can look through that later if you want. Um, one thing we do in IBC Go is we have an on-chain parameter. So an on-chain parameter is a parameter controlled by the chain, by its on-chain governance. And we have a parameter for sending and receiving IBC transfers. So the first thing we do before we send a transfer is we just check to make sure that uh, sends are actually enabled on this chain. Um, then, yeah. yep. No, I was, I was gonna. I was gonna say that this is something that um, it trips a lot of people to understand that if this is not enabled, then the transfers cannot happen, right? So you see people upgrade to uh, an SDK that has IVC, but then they 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 need to go through a governance process, right, to to get this enabled. A yeah. lot of times, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. That's a really that's good. That's a really good point. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I think there's been other parameters as well as like historical entries that chains have had incorrect. So definitely like a, a good feature note of making sure we clearly outline the on-chain parameters that might need to be set to true in order for the IBC application to function. And and, and this is um, like a per application feature, right? So for example, if you have another IBC application it's up to them to decide if they're going to have this sort of um, option to enable or disable, right? Correct. This is only for ICS-20. Do we have this send and receive enabled? OK. And um, under the hood, is this, I'm guessing this is just the unchained parameters that we've been talking about lately. Yes. Under the hood, this is basically just within the keeper, there is basically just like a flag set of just mapping from this key to this value of either like true or false. And is it disabled by default? Yes, it should okay. be. Yeah. Which is why I think the the chains uh, don't have it activated. Yeah. Cool. So when we go to send this transfer, um, we get some of the information, such as the destination port and channel, because this wasn't specified in the message transfer, um, as well as the next sequence to use for our packet and the channel capability. And then it uses, um, uh, we'll get to, I guess I'll go over this first. So um, this, this part is a little bit of a detail of 
how IBC Go implements this in relation to the client side of what should be specified in the message transfer. So I'm going to be figuring this out as I walk through it. Um, so it looks like in the message transfer, what is specified is the, oh, it looks like you can specify either. So it looks like you could specify the full path or you could specify the IBC slash hash, which is used for our internal representation. If you use the IBC prefix, then what we do is we go into this function right here, which will get the full path from the hash. Um, it will parse the hash and then it'll go ahead and in the keeper, it'll look up the full uh, path or what's referred to as a denomination trace here. Um, yes. And then uh, let's see if I can get back to my files. Um, cool. And I think we want to be here maybe. Yes. So we were on send transfer. Oops. What have I done? Ah, wrong file. Cool. Yeah. So now we have the denomination. So the important part here is when we're sending in the packet, we are sending the path. We're not sending this internal representation. So if the message transfer passes us this internal representation, we need to change it into the full path. Then we get to this part, which I was talking about the source and sync. So we have this function right here. This is the part I find tricky in the part whenever I revisit after several months, I have to spend a little bit of time thinking about, which is, is the sending chain the source? Because if the sending chain is the source, then what do we do, right? The source chain escrows. So it gets the escrow address and then it escrows the tokens. And we do this just by sending from the sender to the escrow address. We just do a regular bank transfer within this chain using the tokens and the escrow address that I went over earlier. But if the case that the chain, the sending chain is a sync, then in that case, we burn, as I said. So we send from the account. Um, we actually, we send these to the, uh, to our module account, and then we're able to actually burn these these coins. So we just do like a quick setup and then we burn them um, from our module account. Because that is where we minted the tokens from. Um, but is there, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say, is there a scroll address, like a, a regular a chain address per se, that all the, the tokens will go to that account? Like that you could query like from a bank module? Um, yes. Yes. It's a regular account address. It's just constructed using the hash that I went through earlier. Okay. And the we ensure that because it's a regular account address, right? It could conflict with the public keys, but we use like a prefix when we do the hash. So I think that prevents it from conflicting. And then we have this enumerated, or we have this uh, namespace that we checked all the escrow addresses to ensure there wouldn't be collisions between them. But in the future, the idea would be that you would have different sub accounts connected to a module account, and then you don't have to worry about these collisions. But all of these escrow addresses can be, uh, like there's a CLI function for already getting the escrow address, and then you can just go ahead and query that escrow address on chain to see how much tokens are actually locked up on that channel. Okay, sounds good, thanks. Mm -hmm. So now let's, let's jump into this function. Um, so originally when ICS 20 was written, there was actually, like it went back and forth a bunch of times, but when I joined, there was in the packet, you had to actually specify whether the sending chain was the source or not. Um, but eventually Aditya and Chris put their heads together and figure out a very nifty way of determining the source. And as I talked about, that's by taking the source port and channel and you check it against the denomination prefix. And so here sender chain is source is the same as if the receiver chain is not source. And it made more sense to have this logic in this function, but we get the denomination prefix. Um, and then we check to see if this prefix is the same as the one in the denomination. If it is the same, then that means we're doing the reverse transfer, right? We're sending backwards the channel ID 
matches with the first prefix there. So that means the receiver chain is source. So the opposite is said for the sender chain is source, but it's easier to reason about this when in the reverse transfer case. Um, but that helps us determine if it's a source or a sync chain. Um, and then that is the pretty much the entirety of send transfer. Um, once it actually does the application logic, then it just formulates this packet using the packet data, including the full denomination path. And then the creates the packet, asks the channel keeper to send that packet, and then that's about everything. We just have some metrics there. Cool. So let's go back to the IBC module interface. So now we send a packet. So now we want the other chain to receive it. So at this top level here, what we want to do is we want to decode this packet data and then we want to process it. So we'll do our application logic by calling this on receive packet function. So this on receive packet function will again check if the receive is enabled. Um, this probably could have been the first check. I'm not sure why we checked the, the packet data validation, but they're both very, uh, they're both fine to do since they would both just error. Um, then we kind of prepare things to do our processing. But when I noted in my diagrams, again, the first one thing we ask is who is the source chain? So in the case that the receiver is the source chain, right? This means the sender was the sink. So the sender would have burned. And then this, the receiver, since it's the uh, source, it unescrows. So if it's going to unescrow as the source, it needs to remove that prefix that we talked about. And then after it uh, removes the prefix, it goes ahead and it creates the token, gets the escrow address, and it unescrows these by sending from the escrow address to the receiver. In the case where the receiver chain is actually the sync, right? This is a forward direction transfer. And now we're actually adding the prefix. So we create this new prefix. We add it to the existing full path. And then here we have, uh, we're adding this mapping. So if the uh, denomination trace doesn't actually exist for this hash, then we go ahead and set it in state to make sure we have it there. Um, Otherwise, or in, after that, then we go ahead and mint. Because again, this is the sync. This is a forward transfer. These are new tokens that we don't actually have. So we're going to mint them from our module account. Um, and we're going to send them to the receiver. Cool. So that was a lot in send and receive. Does anyone have any questions about that? I think it's pretty clear. And I will move on to the last part, which is refunding. So we might be refunding on two cases, a failed acknowledgment or a timeout. And so you'll, he you'll see here on acknowledgment, it checks, was this acknowledgment an error? If it was, refund. Otherwise, don't do anything. And same with timeout, except timeout doesn't need to check anything. It knows just to refund the tokens. So the refunding logic, as I went through in the slides, the first thing we want to do is who is the source? In this case, if the sender chain is the source chain, then we are undoing what we did in the source step, the source escrows. So that means if we're undoing an escrow, we unescrow. So we get the escrow address, send the tokens from the escrow to the sender, and that should be everything. In the case where we are the sync chain, then that means we need to go ahead and mint tokens because the sync chain burns tokens. So we undo the burn by minting. So we mint to our module account, and then we send from the module account to the sender, refunding the tokens. Cool. And uh, yeah, so that is pretty much everything for ICS20. Woo! <sighs> that was amazing, man. Seriously, good job. 
Nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's very good. Does anyone have any questions I could possibly answer? Uh, Suarez uh, wrote a question uh, before. Oh, no, I think that's answered already. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Exciting. That was so good, man. Thank you. Um, cool. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, I think the slides were probably a nice intro going into the code. So if you get confused later, I think those are probably good to reference. Um, there's lots of parts of the code that I didn't get into, but I think it's probably self-explanatory. And if you have an understanding of how the SDK is written, then you should be able to go through those. Can I ask uh, just one really brief thing on in a uh, transfer test? I, I think I have it already figured out. I just wanted to validate. There's like one test I wanted to look at. Yes. At the very bottom. So uh, this sort of sending from chain A to chain B to chain C and then sending all the way back. I just wanted to check that my understanding of like the relay, relay packet, I think that was the one. We ha you, you have this in here just to um, basically send the acknowledgments back, I think, is it? Correct. This function right here is just uh, the code above will just call, it creates the packet, and then it'll send it. Um, see here, it has the new message transfer. So the relayer or whoever creates this message transfer, delivers it to the chain, and then we need to actually relay that acknowledgment. Um, and that's what this function does here. It goes and it receives the packet and then it relays the acknowledgement. And the packet commitment here again is just, uh, when does the packet commitment actually get set in the first place? It gets that's set. I, um, send messages, is that's when it gets, that's when it gets uh, Correct, by, right. and it does this by core IBC. So here, when I was going through all the send stuff, the part that I left out was at the very bottom, um, which it creates this commitment. And then it goes ahead and it sets the packet commitment. Uh, perfect. Yeah, yeah, that was actually like this, the final thing that was missing in my brain. And when we use the util send messages, this is just going to go through this flow. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, that just like everything just slotted together in my brain. Amazing. <laughs> That's great to hear.